What's up? This is Rebel Radio. What up? What up? This is DJ Newmark. This is Peanut Butter Wolf. It's your boy. It's okay. Keep checking out Rebel Radio. Rebel Radio. This is Rebel Radio. We're in the place right here. Uh? Rebel Radio is going down. Would you say Rebel Radio? Oh, wait. Let's do it again. Rebel Radio. Guest today, Josh Luber, CEO of Campless, the resale sneaker price guide, and of the newly launched StockX, which is uh, the stock market of things. You can buy and sell authentic sneakers at StockX.com. Josh is my guest today. He's going to school us on sneaker culture, as well as lessons he's learning along the way of building a successful startup. Really great lessons here and a lot of interesting sneaker shoes for anybody that's into to sneakers like I am. And now, Josh Luber. Um, San Francisco, uh-huh. representing to Nike. Oh, nice. So, uh, so I just came from there, so it was very important. I had to figure out where, this one? That one? Yeah. To wear you, you the get shoes the good that, that would yeah. fit in with the whole rest of the presentation. So that was yeah, yeah, I'm sure. What'd you what'd you go with? Uh, I went with uh, OVO tens, the uh-huh. Jordan uh, Drake collaboration, yeah. um, th- and sort of and, and rolled that into my my presentation. How'd that go? Which over? Was good. I mean, it was really good. I was yeah. like, I was there as an outside speaker, and it right. was it was their like annual company. Oh yeah, yeah, Company offsite where it's like a hundred of their top leaders. So it's like every like top leader is there. Yeah. And I got to be up there and tell them like how they're fucking up the resale market and and all this. So it was pretty nice. Fun. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. I bet. Yeah. But that, like, I mean, in, inherently, the fir- I look at everyone's shoes, you know, walking down the street or yeah. whatever. I just look at people's sneakers, right? For and, sure. like, that was awesome in that room. It's like everywhere. Oh, and, yeah. Know, they're all trying to, like, one sure. up each other because they're all, like, top executives of the company. So yeah. It's like, yeah. yeah. I went to um, Amsterdam and met with some – I have a friend who works at Nike, and he's working in Amsterdam. And he took me out to um, this music festival with all these expats, all these expats that work at Nike. And they're all from all over the world. And they're like, everything was on point. Yeah. Like their it, t-shirts, yeah. their little jackets, like their shoes. I was like in another world. It was really cool. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's so crazy how sneakers, you know, have just exploded. Like, you know, I know we're going to talk about mm-hmm. the kind of sneaker head world, but, but sneakers in general, right, are just... But it's a function of that. I mean, it, it's a lot of function. Yeah. It's, it all happens sort of at the same time. I'm sure. The past couple of years. So. I'm sure. Yeah. But I noticed, you know, uh, like I stopped wearing hard shoes probably five years ago. I mean, I've always been a sneaker guy, but, you know, um, but it used to be like, it took a long time before you could wear sneakers in a suit yep. if you're not an actor, mm-hmm. you know, or, or a musician. Right. Um, yeah, it depends on, on where you are in a suit, yeah. But even like, you know, I got... Uh, you know, they have the L.A. Auto Show here, which they have the, like, uh, press days. So the industry comes, and these are, like, the most. They're still wearing pleated, mm-hmm. you know, pants and just, like, you know, and slacks and sport coats, like the most conservative dress. Yeah. And two years ago, you started seeing guys with sneakers, with, you know, blazers, or maybe they were the Kohan yeah, joints, yeah. you know, with mm-hmm. the with the air soles. But, but, two year, but three years ago, they were zero. It was me. And, you know, two years ago, there was like, you know, a couple dozen guys and then, you know, more and more every year. So, you know, it's amazing, I think, how that's how that's coming. And, you know, it's I think it's part of the overall trend of of we're just becoming a more casual society. That for sure. Right. But also the the brands that were making nice shoes. A lot of these designers who were shoe designers, right, are now making sneaker versions of the Mm -hmm. shoes as well. So, you know, you could wear a pair of sneakers that, I mean, cost seven hundred dollars. Right. That are made by, you know, whoever your your favorite designers are. So, I mean, that kind of crossed the line too, where you can still say, you know, feel like you're whatever you right know, you know, dressed up that you're not wearing that you're not wearing shoes that are you know to play basketball in right yeah. which is like that's what the big difference is you feel like you're walking around wearing you know big huge basketball shoes right it's a lot different than wearing you know some you know nice pair of shoes it just happens to be sneakers right it happens to be rubber yeah. sole and, and yeah. all that so absolutely yeah, man. well i appreciate you being here man i i um so i saw your ted talk and i think i you know i'd never heard of you or campless or anything and you know I was, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm a ted fan and uh you know, and this show is about entrepreneurs that are doing things that are culturally relevant. And so, you know, it's exactly 
what you're doing. Yeah, man. And um, so I just reached out, and I appreciate you, you making time for this. Oh, no worries at all, man. The first thing I did was I just hit up Brian. And That's like, what I heard. And he was like, you should do it. I was like, okay. Yeah. And that was literally the whole conversation. Who's Ryan? The Benzian. Oh, Ryan's the man. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've known him Ryan's for a, a while. Friend, you know, I mean, he, he was kind of starting greats right around yeah. the same time as, like, I was getting some traction in campus, and we were both in New York and then all that. So, yeah. So nice. Cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to dig into it. I, I want to know, um, how'd you, first of all, how'd you get, have have sneakers always been part of your life or how'd, how'd that happen? Yeah, I mean, I've collected sneakers since I was, I mean, I can't remember, right? Um, the fir- I, I, ha- I still own sneakers that I played basketball in in high school. I own sneakers that I played tennis in in middle school. Uh-huh. And they look like it, right? Yeah. You know? um, but it's like I wasn't, you know, I wasn't getting rid of them. What were you playing tennis in? Uh, it was a pair of like Adidas torsion, and uh-huh. they had this like they had this they had this system where it was kind of like you know how like you have the Hirachi sock now, and you have this kind of yeah. inner sock lining. So it was like that. So you didn't have to wear laces. So what I would I, when I played tennis, I would wear laces, but mm-hmm. then I would take the laces out and right. walk around without laces. Yeah. And I used to wear those around, and, and you know they look ridiculous. In my freshman year of college, I was wearing them, and I was pledging a fraternity, and the guys were like. That's the most ridiculous looking shit ever, and they made me put in these super fat laces like this thick. Uh-huh. Right? Yeah, I remember those. Wear around those, and those same laces are still in the shoes nice. so right now. And oh my I mean, god, that's they're amazing. like brown and you know, disgusting. <laughs> but like, nice. So I mean, I, st- I you know sneakers is we anyone kind of my generation who still collects sneakers, we all have the same story, right? And, yeah. and I mentioned this in Ted. I mean, like. I grew up playing basketball, right? And if you grow up playing basketball, particularly, you know, in the 80s and 90s, then you want Jordans, and it was mm-hmm. all about mm-hmm. Jordans, right? Mm-hmm. And I always wanted Jordans. And back then, it was fucking crazy to buy a pair of $100 sneakers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? And, like, you know, and my mother looked at me like, there was no way. Yeah, like, I, I knew not to even ask. Like, that was ridiculous, right? Yeah. One, you know, once a year, we'd go to the store, I'd get a pair of, like, you know, the, the like sale store where it was like all the closeout stuff you get a pair of like $30 sneakers or whatever and that was my shoes for the year right but yeah, like for sure you know, all those kids come to school wearing like the Jordans and the first time you saw Jordan fives and someone's wearing a pair of purple Jordans and I was like holy crap you know yeah was so that, that like dangerous to wear that in school like because in my high school if you wore Jordans you were gonna get jacked like, well I also just... went to like you know the like sort of you know rich Jewish suburb school right, right? where like we were kind of cool you know <laughs> yeah. we it weren't really safe. worrying about that <laughs> right. but like but nonetheless it, so it was less about that than it was that like if you were wearing them particularly on the basketball court then there was a huge target on your back you're yeah, like you yeah, better sure. be really fucking good to be yeah, wearing you're gonna Jordans, get hacked. right oh, nice. yeah like you know For and sure. i was like there was no way i was good enough to, to wear them on the court but i wanted yeah. you still wanted to have and them you right, the right? Cred. Yeah. that's crazy you know and i mean I, I never wore jordans on the court until Many many years later, like way after college, and I mm-hmm. got a pair now, and I was just like, like, I don't care. I was like, Were I'm you gonna like, wear them. I'm now I'm ready. My game is good enough. Or you're just like, now I'm older. I, I don't really care about the rules. It was a little bit of both. It was a little bit of both, right? And uh, and you know, for whatever it's worth, right? You know, I had the greatest game of my career in this rec league game <laughs> wearing a pair of Jordans. So I don't know where you you know. Yeah. It's the shoes. Um, it's the shoes, right? But um, but yeah. So you know, I think a lot of us. So I, I was on the sidelines for for many many years in terms of being part of the sneaker community um and you know I, because i was very rational with i wasn't allowed to buy jordans and then once mm-hmm. i had i was in college i didn't really have money to buy jordans yeah. right after college you know i had a little bit of money but not a lot so it was still pretty rational but it wasn't until i graduated grad school in oh six oh six right that I had enough disposable income and, you know, that I was like, well, I don't care now, right? And, like, right. you start right. buying it and all of a sudden, yeah. you know, but it was from 06 to, um, <coughs> to uh, be- uh, beginning of 2012 where um, – and I started campus at the beginning of 2012. Okay. And so at that time, then I went from being a fan, you know, to every day looking at eBay auctions, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. following every single sneaker blog, every – you know, yeah. to being – you know, all the time, right? And and so that just, you know, sort of exponentially. But that was the same time that the whole rest of the sneaker world was starting to blow up. And sure. from, yeah. from end of 2011 through really end of 2014, I mean, those three years were just like massive growth mm-hmm. in, the, in the sneaker world. So I want to talk about kind of how that happened, but um, do you remember the first, your first sneaker purchase or the first shoes that you were conscious of choosing? I remember the first pair of Jordans I bought for sure. Yeah. Right, which was uh, the 2001 uh, Jordan 11 Concords, which was the, I guess, the 
first time that they um, first time that they retroed those, mm-hmm. and it was right in that uh, range. I graduated college, so I had a little bit of money, and they'd come out. And so back then, shoes were you know you could go to the mall a week, two weeks, three weeks later, and still try to get a pair, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And so they'd come out, and I was like, crap, I I wish I'd gotten. So I, so I went to the store a couple weeks late, and there was like one pair at. I don't know, whatever, it was some mall a store. And I was like, yeah, man, you have those in 10 and a half. And the two guys working there looked at me and they looked and they were like, I'm like, what? And they're like, well, there's one pair left, but we were going to sell it on eBay. I was like, no, you're not. I was like, <laughs> I was like I'm buying that, right? Yeah. And so that was the first pair of Jordans that I ever bought. Mm-hmm. And that was a pair that I was like, and I was like, I'm wearing these. I don't care, you know, you know, right. and all that. Yeah. So that's the first pair of Jordans I ever bought. And it might be, you know, because my parents would buy me, you know, shoes up through high school, right? So, right. I mean, that might be the... Yeah. And I still have those. Yeah. Sure. And yeah. they're beat because I wore them playing basketball for a while. It's interesting to think about the world before Michael Jordan, right? And, you know, because... So I, I'm a little bit older. You know, I grew up, like, the uniform was Chucks. In, in my class, you know, 20 out of 25 kids had Chucks. The rest were nerds, right? Um, or the girls would wear their jellies and... Yeah, and, uh, I had jellies. You know, but it was, it, it, it was either Chucks or Winos. Yeah. Right? And that was it. Uh, I got. My, I remember my first pair of Adidas running shoes, the nylon joints, and you know. And then I remember, you know, the first shoe that like that I bought like by choice was uh, Legends, right? And that was a sixty dollars shoe, which was insane to spend sixty dollars. Like you know, my, that was like my shoe for the year. Yeah. You know, yeah. and um, and. And then Air Force One the next year, right? When it, and then Jordan, I think, came out right the year after that or yeah. right around the same time. But, you know, it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't a thing. I mean, kid, we cared about our sneakers, right? And we would go home and clean them and, yeah. Yeah. and all of that and getting a new pair. Of, but it was like, you have a new pair of Chucks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or the weirdo, you know, rock kids had like the red Chucks mm-hmm. or the, you know, different colors. But, but it wasn't this... Um, it wasn't like part of your identity in the way Where'd that you it became San Francisco. Okay. Um, but it, until until Jordan, mm-hmm. right? And and that really, um, you know, that really set it off. And and obviously he wasn't the first uh, athlete endorsing a shoe. You know, we did some work years ago with Pro Keds, who like mm-hmm. to tell the story that Pistol Pete was the first sure. uh, the first athlete to ever have a shoe, and that was the Uptown. Um, but for some reason, mm. you know, between Jordan just being at the top of the game and, and whatever Nike figured out in terms of marketing, like that just completely changed. Mm-hmm. Well, it was Jordan. It was Nike. Yeah. It was the NBA. I mean, everything that was happening at the same time, right? Mm-hmm. You know, you finally had, you know, NBA games that were on in prime time. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, you had this, you know, crossing over, you know, moving from, from Magic and Larry and to right. Michael and, and I mean, all that coming together at the same time, then to have this perfect storm of, you know, Nike and then Tinker Hatfield to design the shoe and then, you know, the marketing that came around with it, right? It wasn't until the Jordan 3 that we had the Spike Lee ads and the mm-hmm. Mars Blackman and, and right. you know, do you know, do you know, do you know, and, and all that. And so, I mean, it was this perfect storm and, and you can't have gotten better and got yeah. lucky that it was right. Mike. Like, you didn't right. know in 1985 right. that he was going to be, you know? No. So, I mean, it, yeah, I mean, it was just, it's really, you know, amazing kind of looking back and all yeah. that. And any big phenomenon, you, know, you look back and you're like, okay, it, it makes sense of how it right. happened. And, mm-hmm. and it's not nearly the same thing, but this last big sneaker boom, I mean, we can look, and it is very clear, 2011, 2012, that was when Instagram became huge right. in the world. And right. Instagram had their own, like Facebook had bought them and they were blowing up. And that was a huge part of sneaker culture blowing up and becoming more mainstream because right. it was easier for people to share pictures of the sneakers mm-hmm. globally all around, right. right? And at the same time, Nike then started using social media for more marketing, releasing shoes, social media, right. and then yeah. NBA All-Star Weekend. So, you know, it always comes back to basketball and, and the NBA was NBA All-Star Weekend in February 2012 was kind of like the defining moment of, mm-hmm. you know, we had these couple releases that we never seen before mm-hmm. and they were releasing it on social media and you had Instagram and all this stuff was going on and that was kind of you can s- almost see it in the number you can see it in the numbers and and then just we had this massive influx of people coming into the community right and that's right. what grows it more than anything else yeah. there's just new people coming into it right but there were people back to you know kind of all this back to, to what you're saying and sort of when we were growing up 
look, I mean, almost everybody has worn sneakers, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, so you have this sort of broad appeal and then you start getting, in, there's the nostalgia part of it. You know, when people started seeing what I was doing, I had all sorts of people hitting me up, guys I played high school basketball with who were like, hey man, you remember those shoes we used to wear, you know, junior year, can you help me get them, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, so it, it, as it became easier for people to re-engage with the sneaker community, to know when things are coming out, to see them because of social media and because right. of it becomes of, uh, you know, all the mass media stories, it brings more and more people back into it, right? right? right. Because sure. we all wore sneakers as yeah, kids and, and growing up. Yeah. Yeah. There's a huge nostalgia for, piece of it. For people who don't get the sneaker thing, is it because they just didn't live through that basketball, like going on the court and like being a part of a team mm -hmm. and like sweating the guy who had like those dope shoes? Is it because they missed all of that? I mean, look, it, uh, not, not, nothing's for everybody, right, right. I guess. Um, but it, there's a there's a huge piece of basketball culture and that because it was Jordan's and because, right. the, you know, those are the shoes. Um, if for, you know, I don't know, whatever reason, all of that marketing, all of that, um, you know, hype and everything had been around, say, I don't know, who, 1983, right? McEnroe. Mm -hmm. I don't know, right? I mean, maybe, right? Maybe it, it would look a lot different, right? right. But, sure. you know, I mean, it, it's always just been basketball and there's just been so much innovation with basketball shoes. And, right. You know. So also, you know, I grew up as a hip hop kid and, uh, you know, for me, like, sneakers were always part of that and basketball was always part of that. You know, and they're, they're kind of so. Were you Absolutely. were you into hip hop too, or is it like? Yeah, for sure, right. But I I was you know ten years you know past you, right. right? So yeah. you know when I grew up, you know, I mean I had a <laughs> I had an NWA tape that I used to like hide under my mattress when I was like in like <laughs> you know fourth grade, uh -huh. right? Yeah. Um, you know, and and I think the first tape I ever bought was like Run DMC Raising Hell, nice. right? So yeah. so, but it was a, you know uh, it was yeah. a couple years later, but sure. you know it was, it was the same sort of thing, but. I was into to hip hop and uh, music before sneakers, almost because it was more accessible, right? Like it's more sneakers, you got to go buy it, you yeah. know. There, and mm -hmm. back then, there were no sneaker blogs, there was no right. internet, there was no way no. to get it, right? And in fact, you know, so uh, the the first hip hop sneakers on the West Coast, right? Because I know they had Uptowns and like, but for us, it was the Shell Toe yeah, through Run sure. DMC. Absolutely. And it was the suede Pumas. We didn't know they were called Clydes at the time, right? right? But um, but those were the two shoes, yeah. right? And and you know I remember getting like finding the different colorways of the Pumas, and you would just freak out. Yeah. And um, but those kind of so you know those kind of stopped, right? And and you know I remember having to go to shoe stores, and you you would know which stores if you talked to the guy, he'd take you in the back right. room and show you the dead <laughs> stock, and right, right. you know. Um, and they were making, you know, the, the ugly new models at the time, you know, this is like in the, in the nineties. Yeah. Right. And that retro thing, it wasn't really a thing. You know what I mean? Like everyone just kind of moved on and they were buying the new Jordans. I don't know that Nike right. was really re-releasing. No, Nike didn't start, start re-releasing Jordans until like 2000, 2001. And where, where did that come from? It came from a, a really, you know, smart person over there who, who realized that, you know, these were shoes that, you know, people would want to keep buying. You know, there, there was also an issue with Jordans where when we got to past Jordan 13, past 14, right? Right. So Mike, well, Mike had retired, you know, a couple years earlier, right? So now they were releasing Jordans and he wasn't playing anymore. Right. And Tinker wasn't designing them anymore. And so they yeah. felt and looked different. And so there were a lot of people that didn't like any of those, you know, from, from 15, you know, on up. Yeah. Um, and so as you start to figure out how to, well, let's, let's re-release the same one. No one had ever done that before. Not, not like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And obviously what that spawned is an unbelievable business, right? I mean, the retro right. Jordan business is, I don't know exact numbers, but I think about half of all of Jordan brand business. Mm -hmm. Um, right. And so, you know, it, it, now it's nuts because they keep releasing the exact same shoes right. over and over again. <laughs> right. And the hardest it's part. Crazy. Yeah. I mean, the, well, the hardest part for them as a business is. Right. There's only there was only a handful of the OG colorways, the shoe, the shoes that Mike wore on the court, because mm -hmm. back then there were only three, four, five pairs released a year. Right. right? To put that in context, to context, the LeBron 12, which just ended, we just started on the 13, the LeBron 12, there were 60, six zero colors of the wow. LeBron 12 released. So yeah. things have changed. But so as they re-released the Jordans, well, there's only, you know, 
five colors of right. the Jordan, you know, three or whatever it is. So they try to come up with new colors mm -hmm. and new stories and new themes around them. And some of those are great, right? And some of those have, you know, great colorway and they look awesome and there's a good story around them. Uh, a great example is there's a, a shoe called the Jordan 1 Shattered Backboard that released earlier this past year or in 2015. And the colorway was awesome. There was some purple and orange and the leather they put on is great. And it, it tells a story of, of this time where, you know, Jordan broke a backboard when, you know, mm -hmm. and all those things combined. And that was like a huge shoe. But there's so many other Jordans, particularly this past year, that those new colorways that they've tried to introduce, right, because they, they average about 50 retro releases a year, which ends up being about one a week, yeah. right? Well, they can't do OGs every week. So the success of Retro Jordans now is really dependent on how many of these new colors of the new stories they can come out and tell that, mm -hmm. that you know, get people fired up and say right. they want to do it. Yeah. The far other extreme, there was a pair of Jordan 7s that released this year that were based on the sweater that Michael Jordan wet wore during the 1992 Olympics. Wow. And it was this like hideous sweater in 1992. Like yeah. think like, I he, don't know, he think, was not, th think like Cosby sweater, like meets oh, yeah. like hip hop in 1992, <laughs> right? It was, it was horrible. And then they like put that pattern on the, the seven and it's like a good kind of cute story, right? But it's horrible looking, yeah. right? So, you know, that shoe was a, a complete flop. So that's yeah. what the Jordan so business is, is doing right now. And, well, from and, the ankles up, he's not, much of a fashion <laughs> no he's not <laughs> no he's not he get and he because of the shoes right he gets ripped more than yeah, anybody course. for that yeah. of course that's funny my that's brother right. FaceTime, that. my mm -hmm. brother facetimed me uh the other day you j just check in and i asked him what he got for his birthday and he goes uh and he like showed me his shoes and they're like old school jordan i was like cool i was like didn't we wear those when we were in fifth grade? <laughs> yeah. He's like, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm pretty sure they're just, like, newer now. Yeah. It's crazy. They still get so excited about it. Yeah. Why do you think, you know, <clears throat> uh, the, the sneaker story, you know, is, um, from the Adidas perspective, I think is really interesting, right? Because they were the number one shoe brand until, yep. went late 80s, 90s? Yeah, I mean. Somewhere in there. Yeah. Um, was it just that, was it was that just Jordan? Did, did did Adidas kind of slip in other ways? Yeah, I mean, I'm not as much of a historian to know, you know, all the things that were going on with the companies at that time. Yeah, right. But I mean, this comes back to what you're saying before. Is, I mean, you can't, and this is why so many other brands are having a hard time even today. As much as even with Adidas and Kanye today, and like New Balance and Asics are trying to create collabs and create limited release strategies in order, mm -hmm. you know, to build that hype. Like you can't replicate Mike, right? right? You can't replicate, you know, yeah. Tinker. You can't replicate all of that thing that happened, which was just, you know, um, and you know, you, you put that right in the middle of trying to compete with shell toes and trying to compete with mm -hmm. things that were relatively, you know, simple um, iterations on top of each other, different colors, mm -hmm. different materials, but you know, the same basic silhouette. Right. But it was like, holy crap, there's air in the shoe right yeah <laughs> right? yeah yeah and, it's totally different yeah and then the you marketing and, yeah, yeah and then the marketing and then everything else uh, gone i mean the first one right the first jordan one there was no bubble and right. everyone's like well is there really air in this and people are cutting <laughs> yeah. open their shoes and yeah, finding yeah. out and you so know and all that bubble. and then spike and all that you know so but that's yeah. a and i and i you know give the caveat right one because in 1985 i was you know seven but also that's as a you know as a a diehard consumer looking back at that you know i just don't have as much knowledge about the actual business and and what mm -hmm. you know those sort of decisions that were made and what adidas tried to to counter with at that time but yeah. i mean you look back at it and it's they had mike yeah, and they had shelters right yeah. It's, yeah. absolutely yeah, yeah. um so so you're uh so you're, you're out of grad school you're you're at ibm i think uh you you sold me my last typewriter um I don't even know. I, no, no offense, to IBM. I don't even know what they do now. Most like, people don't. Yeah. <laughs> last Most I heard, don't. you know, there was a giant computer. Yeah, Watson. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's, it's the smartest computer in the world, right? Yeah. It's gonna, you know, it's gonna rule everything. It's How's like, that going? It, um, you know, you've turned, you've seen Terminator too, right? Yes. Yeah. That's, that's what's going on. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, so IBM is. Uh, I I didn't really know nearly as much about them as I. Uh, oh, you'd have to explain what I mean. No, but I'm just kidding. But no, no. But the 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 key here for me, right, and everything else is. I never thought I would go work at I, I after grad school I started a couple startups yeah. and was running them and I shut the shut down the last one during the crash of like 08 and I never thought I'd go work at IBM but I'm shutting down the company and a classmate of mine from business school is like hey I heard you're shutting down your company you should come work with me at IBM 
And I'm like, uh, I was like, I don't think you get it, dude. My company has four people, right? Mm -hmm. IBM is 400,000. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, one conversation leads to a next. And the key was, and this is looking back, everything was I took a job as a consultant at IBM in their internal strategy group. And what that means is I get to do really high level, you know, good consulting work, but I don't have to travel and I don't have to live a consultant's lifestyle. And I moved to New York because that's where our practice was based, mm -hmm. right? And even though I moved to New York, I worked from home about like 80% of the time. Awesome. Nice. So I go to IBM, I went from, I thought I knew a lot about data work to now I'm a freaking expert because you have to be because you get thrown in the deep end. Yeah. And so that was the intro to like all this data work and doing all this stuff. And it was the first time I wasn't actively working on a startup. Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, I was like, this would be interesting if I could get sneaker data, right? Like just for fun, because I was doing all this at IBM and kind of liking it and kind of becoming a data nerd. But I'd much rather do it for sneaker data than sure. what I was doing. Yeah. And because I was working at home and I had sort of all this, I could sort of time shift my life. And so that was the start of campus. It was it was the combination of all those factors of being in New York, of doing the data work, of having time at home, you know, mm -hmm. of, of to do that. And we did it, right, is I'm not a computer guy, but I, I reached out to a guy who was my co-founder in all my previous startups, it was a technology guy. And he helped me figure out how to tap into eBay, eBay mm -hmm. how to pull out the data, how to get it to someplace that I could use it in a format. And the goal was, can I create a price guide? And that was really like day one, mm -hmm. you know, back in, you know, February, March, April of 2012, which was, you know, I'd been at IBM for about two years. And over the next three years, while I was still at IBM, is I was kind of building campus on the side until I left uh, in June of this past year. So, oh, wow. yeah. And so at what point did that become not just a hobby, but the plan to launch mm -hmm. a business? So before campus, I had started and run um, three startups, two of which were full-time, raise money, build a product, very sort of typical Silicon Valley you know, mm -hmm. type of startup. And I would have been the biggest proponent ever of startups on the side never work. Mm -hmm. right? I would have, you know, until they do, right? Yeah. Which was crazy because sure. so, it was it was totally a passion, uh, a personal thing on the side because it was like, oh, here's my way to become more engaged with sneakers um, because I just love sneakers, right? Yeah. It, there's only so much you can do with sneakers. You can, besides, you know, actually wearing them, but online you can look at mm -hmm. a picture of them. You can yeah. see who's wearing them. You can see when they're coming out, but there's not a whole lot of stuff to do. So um, about halfway into it, you know, I guess probably towards the end of 2013, beginning of 2014, uh, people started picking up on like our blog and our Twitter account and sort of, you know, was like, oh, you know, that's really cool. And, and the sneaker community, like any community, is, is huge. And there are a lot of people that like basketball and hip hop, sure. But there's mm -hmm. people that like techno and tennis or there's people that like, you know, whatever, right? There's a broad group of people. Yeah. And some people like data. Mm -hmm. And for those people, campus hit them over the head so hard. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, so all of a sudden I start getting all these tweets and DMs and emails. And it's like, hey, you know, we love what you're doing. I love analytics. Can I help? And I was like, uh, okay, yeah, sure. Like, I'll, I'll find something. Yeah. yeah. And we, not intentionally, but it happened this way, built a volunteer army. Mm -hmm. And when I sold the company in uh, June of this past year, there were 17 people. You sold were, campus. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we can get to that yeah. and where it's at. I still run it, but uh -huh. but I. Um, so um, there were 17 people who were working with me, all equity, no cash, et cetera. I took care of them when we sold it, right? But it was all people that just loved yeah. data and mm -hmm. analytics and sneakers and wanted to help and wanted to help build this thing. Right. And there were easily over 100 people that approached me. I mean, you got to. It takes time just to find the people that are in it right. for the right reason. Absolutely. But, you know, it was during that process as it was going from, okay, it's not just me who is happy to dedicate all of his free time to doing this because I was like all these other people too. Mm -hmm. And so then it started getting traction outside of just this little sort of nerdy sneaker data community mm -hmm. and, and outside and everyone start. So then over the past year or so, right, maybe call it like all of, you know, I don't know, 2014, end of 2014. I'm trying to figure out, okay, how do I take this thing into a full-time business? How do I leave IBM? How do I go do this? Because clearly there's enough here, right? I mean, all sorts of, of coverage and, and, you know, there was you know, TV things and uh, there's a lot of really good stuff that yeah. was happening. So, um, and even I was asked to do the TED Talk while I was still at IBM, mm. right? I mean, there was no secret about what I was doing at IBM, right? right? There's no way sure. to keep it a secret and IBM doesn't 
do sneakers. So there was no, there's no issue, right? <laughs> but so what happened was I was talking to all these different people and trying to figure out, all right, how do we do this? And there were, I talked to everyone within the industry, all the brands, all the retailers, mm-hmm. all the resellers, eBay, Flight Club, whomever. And there was never the right fit. You know, there was some people that, and there were job offers and there were acquisition offers and there were partnership offers, but there were some people it was like, you know what, like great people, but you know, not the right vision or, you know, have the same vision, but money wasn't right. Or, you know, or really, you know, money was great, but just not working with those people type of thing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so it was right before Easter of this year. And my wife was 39 weeks pregnant with my second kid. So my first kid, you know, God bless her. Like she took all that off my plate because right. I'm like literally running two, right. you know, yeah. 80 hour a week jobs. Right. Um, but my son was about to be born and I knew there was no way that shit was going to fly any yeah. further. Right? right. Like, so um, I don't know. And so I get a call from two guys and they say, hey, you know, we work for Dan Gilbert. Dan Gilbert is the owner of the Cleveland Cavaliers and Quicken Loans and mm. pretty much the entire city of Detroit and about 100 <laughs> other companies. Mm-hmm. And um and he's not in any way involved in the sneaker industry besides owning the Cavs yeah. sort. And they say, hey, we, we work for Dan. We're really interested in what you're doing. Uh, you know, we'd like to talk. Sure, whatever, right? You take every every call. Of course. And, you know, even though I didn't see anything, conversation is word for word the exact same conversation I'd had a hundred times, right? Um, don't think anything of it. And then a couple of days later, um, they're like, hey, we definitely want to do this business. We definitely want to, you know, work with you. Uh, we'd like to fly you to Cleveland and go to a game and, and meet Dan. And so that first half of that statement, I'm like, whatever. Everybody says they're going to do shit. Mm-hmm. Second half, I'm like, absolutely, you can fly me to a game, right? Sure. Huge basketball fan. So yeah. I'm in Philadelphia at the time. They fly me to Cleveland. Um, you know, we watch the game and kind of make small talk. And after the, wor- after the game, we go back and are talking, and it's Dan and his guys. And this was the, the thing where I was like, okay, let's show him kind of what my idea was for campus. And I had this one-page I don't know, roadmap. I, I created it four years ago when I was starting campus. And it was really, really simple. It's like a price guide, which we'd already created. Mm-hmm. And if you have a price guide, then you could create sneaker collections or view a sneaker collection like a, a stock portfolio, right. which we've actually already since created. Yeah. Right. And if you have a price guide, which is essentially asset pricing, if you have a stock uh, collections, which is essentially portfolio pricing, then you could create a stock market, like mm-hmm. a real stock market for people to buy and sell sneakers the way we do you know, uh, stocks. But I'm doing this on the side. I'm not a you know developer, so that's a crazy kind of idea. Mm-hmm. But that was the vision, and I took that piece of paper with me to every single one of these meetings. Serious enough, you know, eBay, you know, Nike, Foot Locker, fin- whatever, you know, all the sneaker blogs, and every single person said, "That's really cool." But what we're doing is this, mm-hmm. and fair enough, right? Like I didn't think right. eBay was going to change their business model. Like, fine, no problem. Mm-hmm. And I show it to these guys, and they look at me like with three heads. And one of them takes out a piece of paper, and he's like. Yeah, we have one of those. That's exactly what we want to create, a stock market for sneakers. I was like, oh. <laughs> so, like, of all the other reasons yeah. of why we eventually get together, like, yeah. there was exactly one other guy who had the exact same idea as me at the same time, and it happens to be one of the most successful business people in the world, right? Mm-hmm. Like, so it was this crazy kind of circumstance of, like, what and, – and they had gone out and started building it, and they had, you know, developers, and they had a great product team building it, but they needed a sneaker guy, yeah. right. and they went out and found Campus, and it turns out the sneaker guy is also trying to build a stock market. It's also run startups. I wasn't, wow, like – so it was this crazy match of, like, what I needed and what they needed, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and, you know, and a week before my son was about to be born, right? So, like, I had no idea what would have happened if that didn't happen, right? Like right? And after – yeah, yeah, right? right. And, and so – I don't. Right. I wouldn't have shut down campus, but it certainly. I certainly yeah. couldn't. You'd, so you'd be on the hustle. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was it was crazy, and so that led to. Um, I've since sold campus. It's that business to Dan, and mm-hmm. are now partners with him in the new kind of reconstituted business, uh, which is called StockX, and right. we're building an actual stock market mm-hmm. for sneakers, which is actually launching in about two weeks. So mm-hmm. this is pretty good timing, and and that's so e- know, explain what that means to say a stock market for sneakers. Yeah. So at the most basic level, it's just a marketplace. Okay. Right? So, mm-hmm. you know, for lack of a better example, right, eBay is a marketplace for, for sneakers, and it is the largest current marketplace. Right? A stock market, when you buy a share of Apple stock at the New York Stock Exchange, you're getting a share of stock, right? In a sneaker stock market, instead of getting a share of stock, you're getting an actual physical pair of shoes. Right. Right. And this was the, the reason that, 
Dan and I got together. It's not like he's been a sneakerhead or, you know, has, you know, shoes with fat laces from middle school like I do, right? But he's always wanted to build an alternative stock market for commerce, for people to buy and sell actual goods using the same platform that a stock market does, mm -hmm. which is one, it's anonymous, right? You buy a share of Apple stock, there's an actual seller for that particular pair of stock, share of stock on the other end. But you will never know who that is, and you don't care who that is. All you care right. about is the price that you're paying sure. for it, mm -hmm. and you know it's real because you're buying it from the stock exchange. So sneaker stock market is anonymous. We, as the stock market, sit in between that. And by the way, we authenticate all shoes. So mm -hmm. you know, a seller sells a pair, right? It comes to us, we authenticate it, and we ship it back out to the buyer. It physically comes to you. Yeah so, in, wow. yeah, so in the beginning, we are physically authenticating every pair of sneakers. Wow. And We'll see what we do as we scale, but in the beginning, authenticity and credibility is so important. Yeah. Of and the only way to create true sort of market pricing that people know, yes, this is exactly, or is to put ourselves in the middle and do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The biggest problem on eBay, well, there's a lot of problems, but one of the biggest problems is that um, buyers are forced to figure out, is this a legit yeah, is seller? Right? Is, is this, a, is, you know, yeah. is this really a pair of shoes? You know, they got to figure that out. You take all that away. You never think about that in a right. stock market, right? So if you read the, you know, all the hype on uh, Uber and Airbnb and like these marketplace businesses that are becoming huge, right? Um, you read any of the articles about them and, and they say that users learn to trust the system that I don't trust you. I'm going to get in your car with a stranger, but I trust the fact that other people years. like me have rated you, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, I don't want to mess up my own rating. And so it's supposed to kind of govern bad mm -hmm. behavior that way. Um, is that, <clears throat> you know, you could certainly just adopt that idea. Why not? So I think that works in certain, um, uh, in certain businesses, right? Um, and eBay has obviously used that, and there's a lot of sellers sure. on eBay that have, you know, Reviews. you know, and, and people do use that as one of the factors within when yeah. you're evaluating that. Um, but sneakers, one, one of the biggest issues with fake sneakers is that people don't know yeah. they have fake sneakers right. because right. some of them are so good yeah. that you don't know. Mm -hmm. So someone could be selling you a pair of fakes, and they genuinely yeah. think they're real. Totally. Right. right. Second is that there's a lot of eBay sellers that have huge, you know, ratings and great, you know, and that what they'll do is there's there's two parts of this. One is sell, you know, nine real and one fake, right? And mm -hmm. you're just mixing in, you know, mm -hmm. one fake and trying, you know. Two is that they're kind of, they, they are fronts for some of the factories in China that right. actually do that. So it's like, yeah. oh, they have 9,000 sales. Okay, it must be good. Well, right, they've been. Yeah. So there's there's Yeah, and a lot of issues. people buying aren't. They right. don't know that they need to look for fakes, so they're not. If for you're sure. not a serious collector, you're not for sure, paying right. attention. Yeah. So, right. so, so two things. So one, we'll be doing that internally on our own, so that we can figure out, you know, are these good sellers, right? If a, we know who the seller is, right? So that they send mm -hmm. us a fake, and we have to, okay, well, we know whether to deal with this person or not. Right. Yeah. But it just you got to take all that off <coughs> of the buyer, right? And just right. it is such a big weight off their shoulders to just not have to do that. Mm -hmm. And between campus and the credibility that we've created, and and me and Dan Gilbert, we're not here trying to scam you, right? We're right. not a, a fly by night organization that you know that we're you know going right. to do you, that. Can you explain? I mean, I feel you, just hearing you like the sneaker community is obviously very passionate, very sensitive. You know, there's all of these worries. Um, so when you built campus, like what? How did you build that credibility? Like, what was that like? What did you guys, what kind of decisions did you guys have to make? And what sort of experience did you have to go through to sort of like, that was like what established you guys as? Yeah, so it's a really good, uh, it's a really good question, a really good point, because people had tried to do versions of price guides before, mm -hmm. right? But they were essentially just someone putting a number Someone's opinion. on a website, right? Well, where does it come from? Right. Right. Are, they're experts and we know. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. Well, we're taking 25 million eBay auctions, mm -hmm. right? So as much of an expert as you 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 are, right? Maybe you've looked at 100, 1,000, 10,000 listings. If you personally have looked at 10,000, you know, listings for a pair of shoes, that would be crazy. Right. We have 25 million auctions. So, in order to um, to explain that and to under you know, th um, campus for a while was just the blog, and. I know that it went over the head of you know 90% of the people, 
but we documented everything, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. All the formulas, all the steps, everything that went involved, in, you know, into creating the numbers, all the math, you know, and you know, a lot of people were like, you know, like, what are you doing? Like, you know, no one cares. I'm like, yeah, but they at least see that we're you know full right. transparency into how we're coming up with all the numbers. Yeah, and there were a handful of people who were. Okay, let let's dig into it, you know, and, and kind of like right. took the bait and said, All right, you wanna like put this out here? Like, I'll go try to find and those were the most interesting conversations. One, yeah. some of them really helped find refine the algorithm and say, Oh, right. you know what? Maybe we shouldn't be doing that. Maybe we should be, you know, mm-hmm. attacking that and a big part of that is on how you eliminate fakes mm-hmm. from the data, mm-hmm. right? I can't look at every pair of sneakers. I can't look and, and see that, you know, so there's a lot of sort of statistical outlier analysis that goes into it and other things so that the data is good because right. we have the same problem as fakes sure. the other. But yeah. all it comes back to is just full transparency into all of the right. work that we've been doing. Right. So s- some people, you know, I think the, the norm uh, is to be secretive about your mm-hmm. algorithm. You know, certainly yeah, like your, your Google, ways. Facebook, you know, Apple, it's a fucking mystery, you know, <laughs> and they keep it that way on purpose, right? Because they don't want you to know that there's really no system at all. But, um, you know, was there was there a thought? Was there any conversation about, you know, should we give all this away? Um, you know, we're, we're basically setting someone else up to just go copy right. what we're doing. Uh, no. Um, okay. I'm a really big believer in general that like ideas are worthless and that execution is everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm happy to talk to me anyone too. about any of it. And, you know, we don't need to sign an NDA for me to tell you about like what, I, you know what I mean? It, if, yeah. if you don't already have, you know, a hundred things to do, right? If you're sitting around and have absolutely nothing to do and waiting to come, and yeah. you're not going to be. Able- you're not going to get it done anyway. Yeah, and yep. so, um, so there was a big piece that that, yeah. I mean, either way, you know, there's there's still so much more to it. So the mm-hmm. big, the most valuable thing that we do, which we actually don't give away because it wouldn't even be useful, is is cleaning the data, mm-hmm. right? So an eBay auction says, for example, Air Jordan Six Carmine name of the shoe and then it'll say kobe lebron yeezy and like 19 other things in the title right yeah you got to clean that out right Right. and and so you know i could tell you exactly how to do it but you still have to do it by hand yeah you know to do it for every single one and so it's a big time consuming how much is uh sorry are you gonna say something go ahead how much is the data versus interviewing and like getting that qualitative stuff like how does that how do you bring those two together because what some people may know is not always accurate because they don't have the data and the data the numbers aren't lying how do you merge those two i'm sorry what wouldn't you say interviewing oh well because you said you interviewed everyone from retailers other sneaker heads oh yeah i mean so ebay's kind of the easy part because Mm -hmm. the data is relatively standard and once we started cleaning it and it's the large majority of the market but there are a lot of other places that people buy and sell sneakers Mm -hmm. and i try to keep track of them and i think by last track there were 45 uh, different online marketplaces and i define that as anywhere someone can both buy and sell Mm -hmm. so that includes facebook instagram twitter Mm -hmm. these very highly unstructured not marketplaces Mm -hmm. where a lot of sneaker sales happen Instagram, someone posts a picture right. of a pair of shoes. It's like, hey, look what I got. Someone else is like, oh, I got one of those for sale. Another guy's like, oh, I'll buy it. I'll buy and it. that guy's text me. Okay. Yeah. How do you track that? Yeah. So, um, wow. so each of those other channels, particularly the bigger ones, social networks, and it, um, we've tried to quantify them. We've tried to, to look at them and try to estimate, you know, compare at least how big is it compared to eBay Mm -hmm. to understand. Mm -hmm. Um, And a lot of that is, for example, Facebook groups of like actually talking to the administrators and the guys who run the Facebook groups where all these sales happen to try to figure out, you know, how many uh, how many times do people post before she was sold? You know, that sort of stuff. So there's a lot. There's a lot, a lot of manual work involved in in data and, you know, automation. Mm -hmm of big data projects. Mm -hmm. You know, Pandora is the greatest example of this, right? Like, I don't know if you know, like how Pandora started, like it was a bunch of guys literally downloading CDs, right? Into the, so they had them. They started tagging them and then, you know, you build it off there. But Mm -hmm. like they started by literally, you know, every single song to to get the base data to be able to do that, Mm -hmm. right? So there is a lot of manual work that goes involved in doing that to get it, whether it's clean, it's in a format that you can Mm -hmm. use and do things with it. And part of that is very much right qualitative and talking to people and just trying to figure out right. you know same thing with ebay compared to the whole rest of the market it's like well how big is it well 
We talk to all the big eBay uh, resellers. Well, what percentage of your business do, do you sell on eBay versus other channels, right? Right. You know, and, and figure it out that way. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that comes into it a lot. But the really cool part about as you know, kind of move to to StockX and stock market and what we're doing is that all that data can come in, right? But now we start creating our own data. And if you can create anything from scratch today, you can build the processes to collect it, clean it, organize it the way you'd right. want it mm -hmm. on day one, right? Mm -hmm. We don't have to deal with any of those legacy systems or other people's, you know, right. businesses. Hey, we're right. doing it day one, so we know exactly how we want to collect it. So we can use it in, in all the other ways later. Mm -hmm. Go back to something you said a minute ago about, the, you know, this idea that, that you're not worried about it kind of given the secrets away where how'd that happen how did you get to that belief um i mean that was that is not about a campus thing i mean that has been right. you know i've started you know four startups and mm -hmm. you know um the very first startup that i ever did was a company called um it was a company called uh, tech experts and it was essentially geek squad before geek squad so this was 2000 2001 i was living in atlanta and would go into people's homes and fix their computers etc mm -hmm. it was a you know service consulting business sure and so i started to try to network within atlanta and talk to some other people about my business and you know it was a small entrepreneurial community but there's some people that were you know and i could so i could get meetings with you know the most important or the most well-respected, you know, people around there. And I remember like taking like an NDA to the first meeting, you know, and the guy like laughed in my face, right? And, you know, <laughs> and we kind of, you know, talked through this and he didn't say it in exactly those words, right? But he was like, he's like, like, do you think that I don't, like if I'm not already doing like 12 other things, right? right. You know, like I don't have time to sit, you know. So, it, you know, it kind of, and, and so I would then be on the other side of that and run into people all the time as you're trying to network and trying to just, you know, and people would be so, see, I'm like, dude, I got a hundred things to do. Like, do you want me to, to give you feedback on your idea, on your mm -hmm. business and, and help you understand it? And so, right. you know, it, it's about execution. And Campless, for example, it's not a new idea, right? Mm -hmm. How it started, at least a price guide. Mm -hmm. People have been trying to do this forever, mm -hmm. right? Sure. I was just the first one that, that tried to use real data and tried to, you right. know, to bring it in and then had to handle the hurdles of what's involved in using real data. So it was how I was executing it. The idea had been out there forever. Right. right. Yeah. Good point. Yeah, I get it. I feel the same way. I'm yeah. like, you know, I'll tell you how we do exactly how we do everything we do. Yeah. It's a lot of fucking work. <laughs> mm -hmm. If you want to do it, you know, <laughs> yeah, go, go for ahead. it. Yeah. Right. The, I mean, at the end of the day, it's just a lot of work. And if you can right. do it better than we can, we're going to learn from you yeah. along the way. So yeah, 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 yeah. that's so, all good, too. So you lived in how many different cities? I grew up in Philly. Uh huh. I lived in Atlanta for 15 years. Then I moved to New York for two, back to Philly for three, and now I've been in Detroit for six months. I lived in Barcelona for about 10 months in between there somewhere. Nice. Mm -hmm. Who's what? your favorite Philly musician? My favorite Philly musician? That's an interesting question. Um, man. I'm kind of partial to the roots. So, so why startups? I... Um, I graduated college in 1999, so I, you know, I, I often say I wish I was either a couple years older or a couple years younger. Yeah, I get it. Mm -hmm. Right? It was like it was right in that thing. I'm in college. I had no idea what's going on in the rest of the world, right? right. So I totally missed, you know, the first, you know, internet boom. And then I come mm -hmm. out, and it's like <laughs> no one's doing There's anything no like that again. Yeah. And, yeah. and so um, today, right, you know, kids are starting businesses in high school and college right. and yeah. you know you have all this thing so yeah. you know it wasn't so I took a job with a furniture company in Atlanta um, and it was a national furniture chain there was it was called nationwide warehouse it was about 160 it was a very sort of nice typical starting business job you know I was a I was a merchant um, and I worked there for about two years and um, I always had like kind of business ideas but there wasn't a there wasn't like a, oh go start a business, you know, young kid. It was 2001, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, internet was, you know, you're still on dial-up and shit, right? right? So, and then the company went bankrupt and laid off like 80% of the company and it finally came around to me and they knew that I was kind of like planning to go to grad school and, and whatever and I wasn't, you know. So, um, they're telling me and explaining being laid off and then they're telling me about unemployment. I went naive 23 year old kid i didn't know what unemployment was i was like holy shit i get money yeah i was like i can get money like 
And they're like, yeah, like it's only like, you know, $250. I'm like, that's great. You know, that was like, that was more than enough to live. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I came back that, that day and was like telling my friend, he's like, well, why don't you start that business like you've been talking about? I'm like, yeah, perfect. So that was, it was, oh, it was circumstance. It was, you know, doing that. And I was in a, I was living in a uh, apartment development in Atlanta, you know, with a bunch of friends and, um, you know, living in a place with four guys and it's cheap. And, and one of my friends was a computer, you know, kid. Mm -hmm. And he uh, had, when he was in high school, you know, he would used to go around and fix people's computers in his neighborhood and, you know, charge them, you know, a couple bucks or whatever. And he, he had gotten laid off at the same time from his job. He was working at some computer consulting company or whatever. And I was like, well, why don't we do this? I was like, I'll build the business. You go out there and actually, you know, service the customers, et cetera. And we were in Atlanta. So it was a perfect opportunity to go hire from Georgia Tech where we had all these mm -hmm. super overqualified, you know, students. So everyone mm -hmm. we hired were Georgia Tech students. And it was like this perfect thing. And it wasn't three weeks into it that I was like, oh, I was like, this is definitely what I need to be doing, mm -hmm. right? You know, and it's, you know, it feels like, you know, you have sort of like, you know, freedom can do whatever, but I worked more than I ever worked. And, you sure. know, right. my yeah. office was in my bedroom. So, you right. you know, never left, you know, <laughs> but it was, there was a no brand. I was like, oh, this is definitely what I want to do. But if that company hadn't gone bankrupt, if I hadn't, you know, then it might have not have been until like the next, right. you know, sort of tech, you know, boom of, of you know, 07, 08 and Facebook and, and iPhones and all that, that I, who knows of what, how I would have ever gotten to it. Mm -hmm. I, I, mm -hmm. At some point mm -hmm. I would have, but it was a forced thing because the company went bankrupt. So I was like, oh, I, you yeah. know, I can do this. So the way you tell the story, especially uh, about campus, is like everything just seems to kind of fall in place mm -hmm. for you. Um, wh what's been the hardest day? The hardest the six to nine months before um, six to nine months before I met Dan Gilbert and started the kind of new trajectory, right? Because it wasn't like that was on the radar. It wasn't like I, you know, there was just this very unknown, right? And I say six to nine months because as soon as my wife got pregnant, right? Which we knew we wanted to have another kid. That wasn't, you know, you know, I knew that there was this, you know, sort of deadline to mm -hmm. like, you know, what we were going to do with this. And, I had a lot of meetings with different people and different companies within the industry that I was like, oh, okay, this would be a perfect partner, right? This would be, you know, this is, and it's a small, you know all the companies, so it's not like there's like someone else out there. And there were a few that came out of that, right, where it was so, you know, I was like, all right, this is it, you know, you're going to the meeting and, and you know, and then all of a sudden it's like, you know, the people just suck or like, you know, you know, they gave you an offer that it's like, Mm -hmm. And so there were a couple times in there where, you know, you just came back and you're like, you know, like, what am I even doing this for? Right. Yeah. Like I, there's. And so then you start thinking, because the last thing I wanted to do was to try to actually go and do this on my own and create, you know, from the ground and do that again and go raise money. And there were tons of people who were, you know, had reached out and it was like, oh, you know, we'd love to invest or did it. But that company, what we were doing, like it didn't need to be a standalone business, right? And to go and go at that myself, and it was like, that just felt like such a, a Herculean task to do with that, and now to have two kids and, and mm -hmm. a wife, and you know, it's like I put her through one startup and the others, you know, before her, and, and to live right. that lifestyle. So there were a few moments in there where, and it was, it was really like kind of leaving meetings that I thought were like, okay, this is it, right? right. This is the one where like, okay, we can finally do right. this and, yeah. and turn it into something. And then it's just like, man, there's like nothing here. And it's like, mm -hmm. am I gonna have to like, you know, you know, am I gonna shut this down? You know, what am I gonna do? And then I like go home and not, you know, not do any work for, you know, like the rest of the night, which was like crazy. Cause I worked like every single night. Yeah, sure. But then like you wake up the next morning, you're like, fuck it. Like, let's just keep doing this. <laughs> like, I don't know why I'm doing yeah. it, yeah. but like you just keep doing it. But there were a couple of days like that. Yeah, yeah we, uh, we had a guy on the show uh, this guy Steve Rennie, who said he he quits six days a week yeah. and he starts seven. <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah, I, I get it, right? Like, you know, it's it's so cliche, right? But the Michael Jordan commercial, right, where he's like, you know, I, I you know, I, I missed, you know, whatever it is, ten thousand mm -hmm. shots, right? Yeah. And then you, right. you know, you make the last one. But um, you know, since all this happened and it came together, like, this has been unbelievable, right? And, and it's been it's been a crazy uh, and. I never use the word like bless, but like, but before that, man, it's like, there's so many days, right? And, and so many days where, and my wife is unbelievable supportive, mm -hmm. right? But 
like I miss stuff for you know my daughter, right? right? Where I didn't, you yeah. know, like yeah, yeah, I get sure. to do the good stuff and I get to like kiss her and put her to you know bed every night, right? But like I definitely miss stuff, you right. know, for her do- during that time. So, of course, you know. yeah, it's true. So talk about the the sneakerhead community. You know, I think there's a a prototype, you know, uh, of the kid that's all hype beasted out, you know, <laughs> waiting in line, all that. But you know, but you were you were at IBM. Right. And, you know, it sounds like you had a different I I would imagine if you had to go the nine to five route and be in the office in a gray suit every day, like there would have been a lot more inner conflict for you. But how many how much of that is out there? How much how many guys are you running into guys or women, whatever? Right. In corporate America that are real sneakerheads. A lot more than than people think. Right. Um. Because that 15 year old, you know, hype beast kid, like he grows up like, yeah, like that was me, you know, in high school. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. Like, but like, you know, they grow up and because we like, kind of something we were talking about earlier, this opportunity for people to easily more easily get back into sneaker community and culture. Right. Mm-hmm. Because of the Internet, because of, you know, there was this book called Where'd You Get Those? Mm-hmm. It was the you know, sort yeah. of classic you Bobito. know, book by Bobito Garcia. Mm-hmm. And. Like that was a seminal question because you didn't know there wasn't the internet, right? No one actually asks that anymore because everyone right. knows, yeah. right? Sure. So because it's become easier, you see a lot more of this, and um, or people that like would like to, right? And and so I get a lot of people all the time that sort of ask me, you know, to either help them, you know, can you help me, you know, find something or direct me? And a lot of it is, can you help me avoid fakes and kind right. of get kind yeah. of right. back to that? Um, but. You know, if you go to a uh, any of these like sneaker shows, like Sneaker Con or, or any of the big mm-hmm. shows, it's still you'll you won't feel any of that. It's all it's youngest common denominator, right? It's all the fourteen and fifteen year old right, kids, right, right. and yeah. a, you know a whole bunch of m- moms and dads sitting in the corner like reading newspapers, waiting for them. Right. Totally. It looks exactly like the baseball card shows I used to go to, yeah. like when I was you know my dad used to take me when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's just that you know I don't need to sleep outside of a Foot Locker for two days, like my time's not worth that, right? I'm mm-hmm. happy to pay, you know, $80 premium on a pair of, sure. of, of shoes rather than sleep outside. Yeah. And so does everyone else kind of in that same category. If you're, yeah. you know, 35 year old guy with a job, <laughs> no matter what you do, like, you know, it's probably not worth your time to, to sleep outside. Right. So they're just not the vocal or not vocal, but like um, the people that we see out there, mm-hmm. you know, that are part of it. And the news stories, it's a much better story to show this kid, yeah. right? A 15 year old kid that, you know, and, and as opposed to just, oh, you know, here's a, a 32-year-old guy that is an accountant and buys some sneakers. And <laughs> right. that's not yeah, story. yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course so, yeah. so they're out there. Yeah. And, and a lot of them uh, contact. Uh, I get a lot of really cool people that contact me sort of t- saying things like I get a lot of people after the TED Talk who said, thank you so much. Now, you know, my mom or my girlfriend understands what it. I do or yeah. like, yeah. you know, and all that, which was like really cool. Cause like the purpose was certainly directed not towards the sneaker community. They know all that stuff yeah, mm-hmm. like yeah. to everyone else and do that. So. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's cool. How much of, oh. don't, don't stop. <laughs> I need to, I need to like me like looking at you. Um, how much of yourself do you like open up for the community? Because you're one guy, you know, all, the fakes but does everybody on your team know it like you do um well so with regard to fakes um i'm pretty good but like i'm not an expert you know at all um but for stock x we need to become experts right right? yeah and so this is you know this is a great story and we haven't like fully announced all the partnerships yet but so i'll I'll keep the names but we've had to figure out how to be the best at fakes Mm mm-hmm and so we were directed to a certain person and we're like, you know, this guy's the best and the content he publishes is the best, et cetera. And we started, you know, looking through it and we're like, okay, this is great content. We need, everyone on our team needs to see this and understand it. And as we're going through, um, we're like, holy crap, this guy's in Detroit. And so now he works for us, right? right. Yeah. And so now we like, we really have an expert there. Right. And, yeah. and I learn more, you know, from him every day. You know, if you gave me two pairs of sneakers and said one's fake, I could probably tell. Mm-hmm. But there's some that are so good that I've had just one pair that I couldn't tell, right? right. But he could. So it's, right. it's great to like, to actually go out and figure out who is the expert. In this. And by the way, this is exactly what I get to do now, which is unbelievable, which is 
the secret community is small and there's only a handful of people doing really great stuff, but I have to go figure out who's the best at whatever they do right. and figure out how we can work with them at StockX because there's never been anyone kind of creating something at, at the level of, I don't know, professionalism and sort of innovation that we've been doing at StockX. Right. And right. by all means, like Campos was its own thing, but now I have basically you know unlimited resources with Dan and his organization, and he's one phone call away from anyone in the world mm -hmm. to be able to figure out how do we do this and 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 so now I get to go in and find the guy who's the best authenticator, right. right? Or find the guy, you know, who's the best, you know, whatever, best historian and knows every single fact ever about sneakers mm -hmm. and have him help and, and right. come and do all the content for our site and so that sort of stuff. So yeah, it, it's pretty really great. cool. So obviously, fakes is a big deal for for you and your and this community. Um, what about for Nike? They're well aware of it. Well, for yeah, sure, of course, sure. right? Um, but they've already sold that sneaker. Right. No one's worried about a fake when they buy it from Nike dot com. Right. Or in mm -hmm. fact, they define fakes as any shoe that's not purchased through kind of their channel. authorized retail. Right. right. Um, so it's a it's a question. It's a larger question around how close does Nike want to get to the resale market? Mm -hmm. Right. For the longest time, they've had this very willful blindness policy towards it. They obviously know it exists. They obviously create it by all of their supply and demand strategies right but they don't talk about it they don't acknowledge it they don't you know engage directly with it right right and fakes are more of that they fakes impact that business not their own mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so i think it someday they will get you know and say okay we'll do it because it's frankly it's pretty it's a pretty simple thing you put an rfid chip in it at, at manufacturer right and, right and that's tied in sure right but they got to make that a priority and, and right. have it do it. And it doesn't impact their business today. So mm -hmm. it's more of a PR thing. And, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. so we'll see. Yeah. Although I imagine, you know, it's it's one thing for a collector, but it's another thing. Like probably a lot of fakes are bought. Absolutely. By people who never realize that they're fake. Oh, yeah. Right. And then, you know, I guess it begs the question, are there quality issues? Are there, you know, yeah. returns that they have to account for you know mm -hmm. stuff like that well have I mean, you ever purchased a fake uh yeah absolutely um i have a pair and i kept it um mm -hmm. i have a pair of jordan 3 black cement that i bought on ebay in 2000 2008 and they're a hor it's a horrible horrible fake right <laughs> and it's so bad that like so we kept it work we're, yeah. you know we're, yeah, we're yeah, definitely sure. keeping that but like and back then you know like i tried to file claim the guy disappeared and, yeah, and right. it's like the bounce and, checks up on the wall yeah yeah yeah, yeah kind of right yeah. uh and some of the the fakes that we've gotten at StockX already um there's a so it's a great story so um so i bought a pair of uh adidas yeezy and you guys are, are familiar with this this is stuff's crazy right now but a pair of adidas yeezy boost 350 so it's the low top version uh -huh. and it's black and i bought a pair that was in the right price range right that's the biggest that's the biggest flag right if it's too good of a deal mm -hmm. then it's yeah. not real right? right but if you're a smart scammer then you price it kind of just like if yeah. the shoe sells for 850 then sell it for 840 right, right. so anyway so all looked good online etc so we bought it got it it was clearly fake right there was a, i could tell right away right it was a decent fake but i could tell so i email the person back and i say hey you know, you said this was real, so I assume you don't know. Because this is well, a lot of times what you get also is that the person selling it doesn't know it's fake. That's the bigger issue because, mm -hmm. you know. So I was like, hey, these aren't real. You know, can you please, you know, refund my money? Wasn't going to try to, you know, start it. Just simple. Let's see what they do first, right? Within 12 hours, they've refunded my money, and they're like, so sorry, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Easy. No, not yet. Hold on. Two questions. So... First of all, you know, you know, we we've seen like the outrageous stories, you know, crazy collections, yeah, crazy uh, prices for a single pair of shoes, ten thousand dollars. You know, and, and you guys are analyzing price, so you know, I, uh, sneaker collecting is an interesting thing because you know, to some extent, there's the physical item that your is your prized possession. Maybe you're going to wear it, maybe not, right? Um, and then, but, but it's also a business, right? And so you're expecting to get some kind of return on this. So how, at what point, you know, does the business rationale go out the window? Like, is there anybody buying a pair of sneakers for $5,000 that's actually going to make money on that? You've hit on two of maybe 
12 reasons, right, why people buy sneakers. This is one of the, the, the come to a larger point, people ask us all the time is, is the sneaker market, the resale market gonna crash, right? Particularly after this, this last run. Yeah. And by the way, this past year, it has slowed down. It's basically been flat where we were having 50, 60%, you know, month over month growth mm -hmm. through 2012 and 2013. Mm -hmm. It's basically flat. It's not really growing anymore. It hasn't for the past year, right? But there's not gonna be a crash the way we think of a crash because it's not, there's not everyone is here for the exact same reason, okay. right? Right, uh, a stock crashes, right? Because everyone is holding as an investment, right? right? And that's the only reason. Yeah. And as soon as that, you know, feels like, oh, that company does something bad, you know, everyone wants to get out at the same time and it's a run and it makes a crash, right? right? Sneakers are not that way, right? There are some people who are absolutely here just to make money, mm -hmm. right? And are just trying to, to flip it. But there's a difference between some people who are just trying to quick flip shoes and move on to the next one right so they're gonna just make whatever they can because they need cash to keep buying the other ones and just keep it flowing mm -hmm. as opposed to there's people who so are it's like a day on. trader yeah kind of more as yeah. opposed to guys who are just gonna sit on sneakers mm -hmm. because almost all sneakers go up over time if they're still new because the number of new pairs on the market right. goes away because mm -hmm. they find their way into the hands of people that want to own them mm -hmm. or people wear them right mm -hmm. so some people are just kind of playing the long game right but there's a far other end of the spectrum of people that have no interest in the business aspect whatsoever and just want to own sneakers and either wear them or collect them or whatever, but could care less about the money, have no interest in reselling, you know, whatsoever, mm -hmm. right? And so for those people, there's no such thing as a crash, right? It's like, okay, the sneaker's worthless. I don't care, I'm wearing it anyway, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Then there's people that wear it right. for performance and actually are wearing the shoes to play basketball, right? right. There's, the, there's the fashion, you know, aspect and prestige of, you know, these shoes cost $200, but you know, I'm wearing $800 shoes, mm -hmm. right? So there's all different reasons mm -hmm. that go into it, yeah. which, you know, impacts the thing, which is why that, you know, it, a crash just isn't likely, the only way a crash is if tomorrow morning, every sneakerhead wakes up and independently for whatever their reason is, says, I don't want my sneakers anymore, sell. Right. But it's many different reasons. So, but if sure. they all yeah. do that at the same time, yeah, then there's a crash. But that right. is pretty highly unlikely right. because they're not all triggered by the, the same thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. But there are, I'm sure, fluctuations, like you said, in, in, the, in the market, right? You're going to have ups and downs. There are, there are ups and downs in the market itself uh, and the size of the market. And is that just going to follow? But individual shoes, right. not so much, right? Mm -hmm. um, sure. Indiv it's great. So we did this analysis and we looked at sort of resale pricing over time and did a lot of shoes. And I swear to God, the shape of the curve is a Nike swoosh. It's crazy, right? That's amazing. Right? You pre-sell and it starts a little high and yeah. then it comes back down after it's released and everyone's <laughs> trying to move them. And then over time, it's just kind of a straight <laughs> linear thing up. It is it is literally a Nike swoosh. It's crazy. That's, that's crazy. And that's on any individual shoe, yeah. right? Um, what will be interesting is because of the market this past couple of years, and it's how many people are, are actually playing that long game, right? It's like, yeah. and that, mm -hmm. that we don't know yet, right? We don't know how many people are still holding it. So like the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, um, the slope of that, that swoosh may flatten right. out more, mm -hmm. right? Sure. But it's not really going down. The only way prices go back down is if, um, if like Nike restocks them or re-releases them. Yeah. And sometimes, right, because Nike will, re particularly Jordans, they will re-release the same shoe. So for example, in 2007, there was an Air Jordan 8 Aqua released, which was this very popular shoe that Michael wore on the court. And that shoe was selling for about $450. But this blast past Black Friday, they re-released the Air Jordan 8 Aqua. Mm-hmm. And that shoe cost 190 at retail and anybody could get a pair and it wasn't very limited. Well, now, like, if you want to wear that shoe, like, who's paying 450 right. for that one? You're yeah. going to buy the ones 190 So that yeah. price goes down for everyone. The only person now buying that shoe is a pure collector mm -hmm. who wants it because it's the 2007 version. But because they wanna, don't have it in their collection or right, something like right, that. Right, or just, yeah. you know, you're more – but, like right. – way way more people want to wear their shoes mm -hmm. and want to show them off etc right. and if you want to wear some aqua eights like you're not like why pay 450 and you can pay 190. Right. Right. so that's the only place it really comes in but every other shoe kind of it looks like the swoosh and yeah. which is just crazy yeah yeah, yeah that that's interesting crazy. 
So uh, first of all, I you know I realized I learned uh, from watching your TED talk that I'm not a I'm not a sneakerhead um, because because uh, <laughs> I went to campus yeah. and and none of my shoes are are on the site. Um, That's okay. Uh, uh, we're just we can't we can't put them all on there. But we'll no, get it's, and, and, and part of it is I'm not really a Jordan guy. Like yeah. that's I like them, but that's I'm much more of Air Force One and mm -hmm. Air Max. Um, but and, and also because I wear all my shoes. Yeah, me too. And I wear all my shoes, and I have way more Air Max than I do Air Jordans. Yeah, for sure. Funny. So, but you know, you mentioned something that you know probably the biggest threat to your business is nike yeah what if nike and goes? so and, and so you know i because they could flood the market if they wanted to right and that changes the dynamics i'm not mm -hmm. i don't know exactly what that does to your business but it's probably mm -hmm. not a good thing at least in the short term um they could uh fundamentally change their pricing structure right uh and you've mentioned this you know in some of your talks where you know, if they were just start selling their shoes at what they're reselling for, that changes the dynamics of the market, right, in pretty significant ways. So, and, you know, I can hear the marketing people listening to this show asking, why, why is this whole thing good for Nike? Like, yeah. why do they allow it? Yeah. Um, it's true. There are several different ways that Nike's, strategy could impact the resale market negatively mm -hmm. right and and overall i kind of the resale market as a whole that would then negatively impact you know our business sure um this is a good thing for nike the resale market is tens of thousands of people that are happy super engaged and loyal right um who maybe otherwise might not even be buying sneakers right, right. uh if you're a 15 year old kid right where are you getting money to buy a $200 pair of sneakers? Where are you getting money to buy a hundred of them, right? Mm -hmm. Like if yep. they can't resell, if they can't make a couple bucks, you know, moving some shoes, how are they getting any money to buy any shoes, mm -hmm. right? You yeah. get back to like how crazy my mom, you know, there's no way my mom was, was right. buying me one pair of $100 Jordans, let alone a hundred, right? <laughs> right. right. Um, so there's something around that, but at a much bigger piece, right? I mean, this is just marketing. Yeah. Right. This is marketing and, and brand, you know, hype and cachet and, and all the things that go around with having any limited, um, intentionally restricted supply, limited product. Right. And we have this with women's handbags. We have this with watches. Mm -hmm. We have this with a lot of other, mm -hmm. you know, any sort of pure collectibles. You know, so this is not a completely unique Nike thing, but they have really perfected it. Right. For, for a lack of a better word and, and and scaled it, you know, more than anyone else. The best example of this is. Right. Let's use very sort of simplistic numbers. Right. If if demand for a shoe is 100 and Nike releases 96 pairs, they will sell 96 pairs. Mm -hmm. Right. We'll have a complete instant sellout. No problem. The secondary market will exist. People will pay more money because there's an a, a imbalance. Right? right. More people want it than can get it. Yeah. Right. But if Nike produced 102. Right. Demand was 100 and they produced 102. They might only sell 80. Somewhere less than 96. Mm -hmm. They're producing more, but they're selling less. Right. And the reason why is because if there's not that supply demand imbalance, right? If anybody can walk into a store and get a pair, well, now sneakerheads yeah. don't want them, mm -hmm. right? They want something that no one else has. They want a pair of shoes that cost $200 but are worth $400. Right. And you start taking that away, and you're going to lose, you know, your biggest group of customers, right? And you know, sneakerheads don't want them. And then so resellers can't make any money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it's like this downward spiral that comes back to Crazy. maybe it's 80, maybe it's 70. Who knows how big that drop off is for that particular shoe. Once you move outside of that, it is not no longer, you know, worth more than what you're paying for it. There's no longer excess demand. It's no longer limited supply. Yeah. Then you're just competing against every other product that it costs that amount, right? If a shoe retails for $200, right? And it's not, and it's worth two hundred dollars. That is a really tough sale to a fifteen-year-old sneakerhead who already has a hundred pairs of sneakers, sure. but not a lot of disposable income, right? right? Yeah, and, and, that's, and that's that's what that, gets back to because it. that's a phone. Yep, it's a you know, couple big nights out. It's mm -hmm. it's you know, a whole bunch of other things. It's a pair of Adidas Yeezys that are worth a thousand dollars that cost <laughs> yeah. two hundred if you can get a pair, right? Yeah. So there's a lot of other things they can do with their money. Yeah. So you know, it is it is a a net positive thing for Nike and the amount of money they 
theoretically lose because th there's no guarantee that they could get the higher price because mm -hmm. right. once they change mm -hmm. that dynamic, right, like people aren't necessarily going to pay that, right? Yeah. So, you know, it's this is, and I don't know nearly as much about how they analyze it, you know, internally at Nike, but this has got to be the um, decision and analyses that are going on there to try right. to figure that out. It's like, how do we maximize retail sales? Because they're in the business of selling shoes. Sure. They got to want to sell as many pairs as they can. How do they maximize retail sales without crossing that line mm -hmm. and going over so that we're now putting out more pairs right. than there is demand? And yeah. it's a really, really fine line. And every single release, there's another opportunity for them to play that game and either you know win or lose. Yeah. And some of these Jordans that we've seen this past year, the Jordan 7, whatever it's called, Olympic sweater, right? Like there was like not a lot of demand for that to begin with. And then they put out more supply than there was demand. Mm -hmm. So it's not worth anything and it's right. ugly. And so, you know, so yeah. it, that's a downward spiral that, you know, they sell a lot more of. So yeah. it, it's a, it, it is an unbelievably nuanced and fascinating business scenario that doesn't exist like that in any other part of the world. And it's, right. mm -hmm. it's a, it's a amazing thing Nike's created. Mm -hmm. It yeah. really is. Yeah, and, and you know my favorite thing about about what you just said is that you know they've created a marketing army, right? That these people are, you know, super fans. They're influential to some extent, right? And they're and they're marketing Nike and Brand Jordan on the company's behalf, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think you know so many other companies. Well, I guess what I wonder is, is it that so many other companies just don't get that? Or do they just, no one else has Jordan? Uh, both. Um, for sure, you can't replicate Jordan. But, like, the strategy is out there. The strategy is not, yeah. you know, Adidas, you know, they're only a little bit, you know, a year into Kanye. They've released basically six Kanye mm -hmm. shoes. Mm -hmm. And it seems like they're trying, it seems like they're doing it right with, with the, the Yeezy. Um, and we'll see as they continue to release them and how many, how, how quickly they can get to a mass market shoe. Because right now it's so limited that they're not making any real money from retail sales, right? They need mm -hmm. to figure out how to keep, you know, increasing supply and still keep mm -hmm. it, you know, limited. But they've proven, Adidas has proven to have no clue how to do it, you know, right. previously. Yeah. You know, they've had a handful of shoes over the past year that came out, they were relatively limited and sneakerheads loved them and sold for a lot of money on the secondary market, right? So the best example is last year, two years ago, there was a model, it was a brand new model, it was called the Adidas ZX Flux. Mm -hmm. And the first shoe they released of the ZX Flux was this multicolor prism pattern on it, right? It looked like kind of like a kaleidoscope. It was beautiful and no one had ever really seen that pattern. The whole shoe was like it, it was awesome. Retailed for 130, no one could get it. It was reselling for 200, 250, right? Awesome, right? You have all this buzz, everyone's talking about it. Well, Adidas saw that and they just kept re-releasing it. And they must have re-released that shoe six, seven times. Wow. Right. And now you can buy that shoe for less than retail on yeah. eBay yeah. because yeah. they flooded the market. They, really, they were trying to basically yeah. kill the golden goose. Like, oh, well, people are buying it, so let's just produce yeah, more. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's like, no, like put out some other colors, like let <laughs> some of those have real value. And so right. kids keep it in their closet and be like, oh, look what I got, right? right. It's an Adidas. Yeah. And they totally killed that. And they've done that with other shoes as well. So it'll be interesting to see with, with Kanye and, and with the Yeezy of where that goes to and how they do that, right? Mm -hmm. But that, I mean, it's like the strategy is there. Like, I don't, yeah. they shouldn't have done that. Like, yeah, you don't yeah. need Mike to know, like, you shouldn't have put out more of the ZX Fox right. Multi, right? So Sure. We have so, room for one more. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, well, we'll end on this then. You know, help me understand. Uh, you know, I'm an old school guy. I get why, uh, you know, Michael Jordan's the best basketball player ever. You know, you like basketball, you want to wear Jordans, right? And then that becomes a trend, so it gets further and further away from people who actually think it's going to help them perform on the court. But there's still that some fundamental belief. Like, the, the, even if logically you know that it's not really going to help your game, right? A little bit of that emotion you're yeah. buying into. Mm -hmm. Why is anyone buying Yeezys? <laughs> well, the, it's not an athletic <laughs> shoe. Right. It's definitely not an athletic shoe, right? Sure. So you can just take that completely off the table. All right. So two things. First, the whole thing is just supply and demand, right? They have made them very limited, right? And people love Kanye. Forget about sports. Forget about whatever, right? Like, yeah. I grew up 
watching Jordan and Jordan was the biggest figure in the whole world, mm-hmm. right? right? But like, you know, kids today, like they grew up watching Kanye and, and he is right. as, you know, he transcends all this. Mm-hmm. And so between this Kanye, between they've made it limited and they've done a great job of getting it into the hands of every celebrity and, you know, between the Kardashians posting it and giving it, I mean, mm-hmm. so it, it gets out there. And if you have that situation where you have huge high demand and limited supply, then there's a lot of money to be made. And the, that is an upward cycle where there's super prestige of having a pair of Yeezys and wearing it. I mean, even the the, the cheapest one resells for $1,000 right now, right? Wow. And, and up from there. I mean, some yeah. of those, if you have like one of That's the first crazy. ones, particularly if you have like the women's sizes, like uh, like four, five, six, are go for ridiculous amounts of money. Um, and because they're they're even more limited and you kind of cross over with some guys who maybe have small feet or whatever, it's, that's a true thing, right? Yeah. And so those will sell for $3,000, $4,000. $4, and so then everybody gets into it even more, right? James yeah. was a women's oh. six, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> what's uh, what's yeah. the beef with um, Kanye and Nike? Well, Kanye was with Nike, right? And they did two models of the Yeezy, Yeezy yeah. 1 and Yeezy 2, three colorways of each. And I don't know all the you know inner workings, but you know Nike doesn't pay for collabs like that, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not like LeBron where you know LeBron is doing you know hundreds of thousands of shoes, right? They did a couple thousand pairs. It was fun. Kanye was actually the first non-athlete to get a shoe at Nike, so it was a big deal. But uh, my understanding is that Kanye wanted money. Kanye wanted to be paid for that, right? Right? And Nike said no, so they they went to Adidas. <laughs> and there's a lot of hype that gets generated, but like. It's super limited. They're not mm-hmm. selling hundreds. Mm-hmm. Of th- there's no money there to pay Kanye right. from sales, right? I mean, if you want to pay it on a marketing basis and, and what it's done. Sure. But Adidas, I assume, is going to try to turn this into a mass market shoe where they can sell hundreds of thousands and really move units. Mm-hmm. There's a little bit of rollover that you know people say, all right, well, I'll buy other Adidas because Kanye's with Adidas or sure. he's wearing it. But like people want the Probably easies, not. right? Yeah. Like yeah. that, you know, that's what they really want. So if they can get that to a mass market shoe somehow, okay. And they're hitting right in it. I mean, to the very first thing you said, right? Or, or the point you were making, which is that, okay, Jordans are basketball shoes, but like no one's wearing them to play basketball, particularly yeah. retro Jordans. Who's wearing 20 year old yeah, tech no, to play basketball, right? Sure. So they're like, well, screw it. Like we don't need to make any athletics. We'll just make a shoe that's limited that Connie likes that people can wear anywhere yeah. all the time anyway. And do that. So it is an uh, it's an amazing phenomenon right now, and it's happening on, be on the resale market because of all those factors, you know, combined together. That people are just thousand, and they're not slowing down. They just yeah. keep going up. Yeah, yeah. It's funny you say that about old tech. Like, I started playing tennis last year, and I was trying to play in my Nastasis, and like my coach was like, "You can't wear those shoes. Get out of here. You can't. <laughs> That's not gonna work." No, definitely not. Um, but wait, I, I do have one more question. Come on. So for, you know, our homies from Greats and, um, you know, some of the more boutique, like startup sneaker brands, what's the opportunity in in the sneakerhead market for brands like that? I mean, it's it's really tough, right? Um, I mean, what Greats is doing is awesome. And you need a model like that where you can take out a lot of costs and go direct Mm -hmm. to consumer and and just, you know, control the brand and control everything, you know, on its own. Um, But... You know, it, it's it's going to be a, a niche. You're not going to sell sure. hundreds of thousands of units, you know, like that. I mean, you know, they, there's a picture of, of uh, Durant wearing a pair of greats, right? That was all. But you're not selling hundreds of thousands of pairs. One, you're not an athletic shoe, so you, mm-hmm. you can only appeal to the sort of the fashion and, and you right. cut out you know, some of that. Um, there's not a room for a lot of those, but, you know, I think that um, there's a handful if they stay in that price point, because a lot of the others just go directly to the, you know, $400, $500 price point and say, you know, we're going to be super premium, sure. right. you know, et cetera. I think that, I think it's good. I, you know, I, I, but um, it takes some time for sneakerheads to want to move over because that shoe feels less like a sneaker than it does a dress shoe. Sure. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's got a rubber sole and yeah. it's, you know, technically a sneaker, but it feels more like a dress mm-hmm. shoe. Right. So, you know, it comes back to, you know, design, make it look cool. And, you know, and, and Ryan, I mean, Ryan's already been trying some of this stuff, right? Working with Marshawn Lynch and trying to figure out how to make limited stuff and, mm-hmm. and do that. But, yeah. you know, I, I think it's there. But, you know, it's tough. They're never going to be Nike, right? Yeah. But they can, yeah, yeah. They can I don't build think a business that's the there. goal, right? Yeah. I think they can build a business there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice. Well, thanks for being here, man. I appreciate it. It's thanks been, for having uh, me. 
amazing. You've been generous with your knowledge. I appreciate yeah, that. It felt like a radio lab <laughs> um, podcast interview. I love it. Well, come back anytime you want to promote something, and, and uh, we'll be watching StockX. For yeah, sure. thank you very yeah. much. StockX will we'll launch in a couple weeks. StockX.com is, is open. Anyone can sign up for access, and, and uh, we'll, we'll release it in a couple weeks. And, nice. You know, that's it. So I appreciate you guys having me. Thank Go you buy much. some sneakers, y'all. Hell yeah. All right, that was my man Josh Luber from Campus and StockX. I hope you learned a lot. I hope you had fun. I hope you come back next week for more Rebel Radio. Subscribe on iTunes. Leave us a comment or a review and tell a friend. Peace.